Well, hi, everybody. Friday. Good to be with you. The 11th of March. Hope you have great plans for the weekend to include joining us for in-person worship with for the first time in almost two years. Well, it's been over two years, uh, except for a brief respite last summer. We're going to be meeting with masks optional. So if you've been waiting to get back into church because you're required to wear a mask well that requirement is lifted and um, would hope that then this would be time for you to come and join us also we're going to be celebrating on sunday at all three services uh, communion at the rail and uh, back to the way it used to be and so hope you will join us for that there are also remember options for those of you uh, who would rather continue to receive the celebration cups for communion uh, at your PO. So the band's back together <laughs> as the Blues Brothers would proclaim. And we're very excited and hope to see you. Our services, of course, are Sunday morning at 8.30 and 11 and 5 o'clock. Hopefully one of those will fit for you. We're still going through the Gospel of Matthew. We've moved out of the Sermon on the Mount, and we're catching up with Jesus and his disciples in Matthew chapter 8. I'm going to read verses 5 through 11. You'll hear the kingdom will come up twice in verses 11 and then again in verse 12. And Jesus doesn't really use those interchangeably this time. Uh, he, there's a little bit of a different nuance between the usage of kingdom in verse 11 and verse 12, but we'll get to that in a minute. So Jesus is still at the uh, Sea of Galilee. He's um, going to now enter into the city of Capernaum after being out in the, probably on the, the outskirts of the city around the sea. And uh, he's going to come across a Roman soldier. So a little historical background here. Roman, not Roman, the Romans uh, were the oppressors of many in the first century, and they had taken over the rule of Israel. And so that included Judea, which was up north where Jesus was. And then they would station uh, soldiers and prefects, um, we call them governors, like Pontius Pilate and others, to rule those particular areas. And so it's not uncommon then that Jesus would encounter a Roman soldier. But it is a bit uncommon that Jesus would be summoned by a Roman soldier, and not just a soldier, but an officer of the Roman army. Now, one of the reasons why Rome was so prolific in being able to conquer so many, well, there were two reasons, really. Number one, uh, their army and their tactics uh, were well advanced for their day and age. Number two, they practiced what was called the Pax Romana, or the Peace of Rome, or Roman Peace. And really, uh, that, that was a kind of a political ideology that said people could continue as their people groups, like Israel. They could have their own leaders. Um, up in Galilee, King Herod still ruled. Uh, he just ruled under the a watchful eye of the mother country, Rome. So the reason this worked then is because uh, Rome didn't have to come in and, and put in their own government. They allowed the people to govern themselves and then they gave them a broad purview of how that might work. But at the end of the day, uh, as Jesus found out, Rome was uh, the power and the authority of the land. So, Jesus will encounter a centurion. The way the army was divided up in Rome was that there were tent groups that included eight men, eight soldiers. 
Then there were the sentries, uh, and that was made up of 10 tank groups. So that would be 80 men. Then there were cohorts, and that consisted of six sentry groups. And so that would be um, 480 fighting men, not including their officers. And then there were the legions, and that consisted of 10 cohorts. So you're getting up in the numbers. Well, Jesus encounters a centurion. So this would be a leader of about 80 men, 10 tank groups, or um, 80 men. Yeah, it's called math, Steve. So far, so good. You guys with me. <laughs> so let's now with that background and that context, read our text. When Jesus, Matthew writes, when Jesus had entered Capernaum, a centurion came to him asking for help. Lord, he said, my servant lies at home paralyzed, suffering, suffering terribly. Jesus said to him, shall I come and heal him? The centurion replied, Lord, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof, but just say the word and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. When Jesus heard this, he was amazed and said to those following him, truly I tell you, I've not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Then verse 11, the first usage of Jesus in the kingdom. Jesus said, I say to you that many will come from the east and the west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the subjects of the kingdom, here's the second usage, verse 12, but the subjects of the kingdom will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Then Jesus said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would. And the servant was healed at that moment. This is one of the more remarkable stories in all of scripture, I think. And there's a lot going on here that without some background, we wouldn't know what's going on. First, it is very unusual that a Roman officer would approach a Jewish rabbi, almost unheard of. And that <clears throat> somehow this Roman soldier had faith in this Jewish rabbi. Now, we ask ourselves, how in the world did this soldier hear of Jesus? Well, he's in Capernaum. Where has Jesus been doing the bulk of his ministry? Well, in Capernaum and the sea and around the Sea of Galilee and the other cities. So, of course, it's just natural this leader of Roman soldiers would have heard from one at least of the 80 that this rabbi was beginning to uh, stir up a following because primarily the Romans were concerned about insurrectionists. And so when someone in Israel, especially a religious leader, starts to attract people, a following, then Rome would take notice. The centurion would know that Jesus was beginning to gather a crowd and perhaps concerned about an insurrection. By the way, which was not that uncommon in the first century especially in Israel. There were many who came before Jesus. There were some who came after Jesus. And in fact, the destruction of the temple in 70 AD was uh, Rome putting down its foot against the Jewish insurrectionists. This Roman centurion says to Jesus, I understand that you have the power and the authority to heal my servant. Now I'm unclean. I understand, Jesus, that you would defile yourself if you came under my roof. But I also know that if you just gave word, 
you would be able to heal him. See, this is a man who had power. This is a man who had authority, understood, he understood the necessity for power and authority of those who were above him, those who controlled the the cohorts and uh, the legionnaires, those who would uh, be over 10 cohorts in the legion of Roman, in the Roman army, would tell him what to do, and it would be done. He would have 80 men under his purview and authority and power uh, to whom he could say, go, and they go, come, and they come, do this, and they do it. He's ascribing to Jesus by faith. He's saying, I believe you can do this. I believe you have the power. I believe you have the authority to heal my servant. Jesus is shocked and surprised then in verse 10. When Jesus heard this, Matthew writes, he was amazed. And then he said to those following him, so Jesus is now turning to certainly the 12, but probably much of the crowd that had gathered at the Sea of Galilee when Jesus was preaching his sermon. He says, truly, I tell you, I have not found anyone in Israel with such great faith. Wow, this is a remarkable saying of Jesus, because Israel was known as a people of faith. They're the people of God, the chosen people of God. When Jesus says this, certainly this would get the attention if there were any Pharisees religious leaders, um, they would, their ears would perk up and go, what is he talking about? Even those who weren't religious leaders would question Jesus, a centurion, a Roman, a soldier, an officer that is being held up for his faith. Jesus then makes an even more astounding comment. Verse 11, I say to you that many will come from the east and west and will take their places at the feast with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. What does Jesus mean by this? Well, he's saying that not just here in Israel, not just here in uh, Judea, not just here in the promised land of Canaan, will there be those who enter into the kingdom with who uh, a- Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and those are the patriarchs of the faith of Israel. No, but those from the East and those from the West. Jesus is making commentary on this one who is from Rome. Uh, this would be, uh, let's see, West of Jesus. And um, so Jesus is making comment, this man by faith, will be entering in the kingdom of heaven. This would be shocking. Now, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the patriarchs of Israel, would certainly be included in those who would be in the kingdom of heaven when it comes. But the fact that there would be Easterners, maybe even this Roman soldier, um, or Westerners, and I said East, I'm getting confused. It would be West of Galilee, (laughs) So it'd be west of where Jesus was, Rome would be, Italy. And so this is kind of shocking then, I think, that Jesus would say this. He's broadening the kingdom beyond Israel, beyond God's chosen people. And then in verse 12, as if Jesus hasn't incited enough, this crowd, he says, but the subjects of the kingdom, who's he talking about here? He's talking about Israel. Those of you who are already God's chosen people, those of you who consider yourselves already in this kingdom, you, did you catch this, will be thrown outside into the darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Ooh, man, Jesus, you're on a roll here. (laughs) You're teaching in a very risky environment. What do we learn here? Namely this, and this is what I want you to sit with today. It is by faith, not by divine proclamation or appointment 
or being of the right ethnicity or people group, or even I dare to say religion, but it is by faith in Jesus Christ and Jesus alone that gives us entry into the kingdom of heaven. And it doesn't matter if you're from the West, like this Roman soldier, if you have his faith, you're in with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. If you're in or think you're in, even an Israelite as part of the kingdom now, if you don't have faith, you will be out and put into darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. It's a word picture for being outside of the kingdom of heaven. Jesus then, to make his point, said to the centurion, go, let it be done just as you believed it would be. Jesus' primary proclamation was the kingdom of heaven. And it wasn't just for Israel, but all who believe. Which for those of us who are Gentiles is quite the gift indeed. Let us pray. God, thank you. Rich text today. Uh, it, we see in it your upside down kingdom. Things are not as we, and certainly not as Israel would have expected them to be. We're grateful that it is uh, by grace through faith, not because we were born in the right place or to the right people or in the right religion, but by faith, Lord, by grace we enter. Just like this centur the centurion who, from all respects to Israel, was born in the wrong place, born to the wrong people born in the wrong religion. So bless us, God, to know and be confident that we are saved by grace through faith. And it is in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Hey, thanks for bearing with me today. Uh, you can continue to tell the kingdom of God is not only Jesus' favorite focus or um, topic of preaching, but it happens to be this guy's as well. <laughs> Hope you're enjoying our time together. Have a great weekend. God bless you. We'll see you Monday. Bye-bye.